No matter what hardships were ahead, I knew that when it was over, I would be happy again. I would be happy with my life. The banks closed at noon, so I couldn't start separating and transferring finances until Monday. I figured I could contact Verizon and Xfinity online and cancel those services next week once I filed the paperwork. The first thing I should have done was call Ted and ask him to write up the divorce papers and file them as soon as court opened on Monday. As I dialed his number, I got ready for his surprise. No one, including myself, expected such betrayal, from Sarah, or me. But after almost six months of this, someone must have had doubts. I couldn't believe she kept such a huge secret from everyone. I decided to call some others to see if they noticed anything. Sean, what's up? Are you ready to go fishing? The cabin is burnt, but I've caught some amazing rainbow trout from the Tokoa River this year. Maybe sooner than I thought. To be honest, no. This is both personal and work-related. Sounds serious. Hopefully nothing happened at work. I haven't heard anything bad on the news. No, not work. And it's even worse than you can imagine. It's Sarah. Please don't tell me it's Sarah. I'm sorry. I wish it wasn't true. But yes, it's Sarah. I need you to file the papers as soon as possible. Monday morning if you can. I want to keep it quick and clean. Can you take on this case? I mostly do criminal defense now. But 10 or 12 years ago, I worked mostly on divorces. I'll handle it for you. Just tell me what you want and what happened. I need to know if this is because of something she did, or you found someone else and think the grass is greener. If it's the latter, I might refer you to another lawyer. I've only ever wanted Sarah. I have proof she was with two guys on a boat on Lake Altoona today. It's been going on for at least six weeks. You mean she was physically involved with these men? Yes. Undeniable proof. Not a misunderstanding or false info. I have a video of it from a few hours ago. How did you get the video? Who gave it to you? I recorded it using a drone I built after the shooting last year, the one we tried to get funding for. I understand. We'll need to check the legal side of getting this video without a warrant. You probably know the rules already, right? Yes. They were out in the open on two boats tied together, in broad daylight, visible to anyone on the lake or flying by. If this is all true, there shouldn't be a problem with using the video. Rules for evidence aren't the same for civil cases as criminal cases. It's good you followed the law, though. Thanks. Let's talk about splitting our stuff. I want an equal split. Personal items stay with their owners. 50-50 on joint accounts and no alimony as she makes twice my salary. We'll appraise the house and property. She can pay me my half or we sell and split the money. Each of us keeps our retirement savings, and with our son grown and in the military, no child support. We keep our cars and small things like phones and take our own bills. I don't want to pay for her and don't want anything from her. I think you might be talking about a lawsuit for breaking up the marriage. Not many states allow that anymore. Georgia doesn't. It's an older law. Well, let's get started. This seems fair to me. Thanks. How much for an advance payment? I'll give you a family discount. Don't worry. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot for your help, but I can't let you treat me differently than others. It shouldn't show any favoritism. I'm looking into any defense where you might have an influence. I can't risk any case I'm handling. This is a line I won't cross no matter what. While this opportunity is tempting, I must say not all lawyers are corrupt. Strong ethics matter a lot to me, I'll give you the best representation and my services will be easy to access. And let's keep this purely as an act of friendship. Thanks. I replied. Hey, don't get me wrong. I'm not a jerk, but I need to see the video you mentioned. It might be important for negotiations. Yes, I know. I'll email it now. Let me get my laptop from home. From home? Where are you now? I'm on the patio waiting for the grill to heat up. I bought a steak and I'm cooking it for dinner here. When is Sarah coming home? Not today. She plans to stay overnight at her friend Jessica's. They might go to the lake. 
So I don't expect her today unless she changes her plans because something scares her. Well, how about I bring a steak and come over to your place? We can watch the video together. You can show me the drone and its features. Who knows, I might hire you as a private investigator someday. Do you have extra potatoes and bread? I have baking potatoes and mushrooms, but no bread. Okay, I'll grab some Texas toast. This will be great. I have some amber beer in the workshop fridge and a nearly full bottle of Woodford Reserve. I'll be there in 30 minutes. By then the coals were almost white and I knew they'd burn out before Ted arrived. So I added more coal to the grill. Then I went into the kitchen to wash another potato and wrap it in foil. I set up the table on the terrace with plates and cutlery near the grill. I checked the grill again, noticed the charcoal was turning white, and put them under a third of the grill. I placed the potatoes on another part of the grill and closed the lid. Once the potatoes were cooking, I brought my laptop and drone outside. When Ted arrived, we prepared our steaks with oil, salt, pepper, garlic, and a bit of onion powder, then started grilling them. How do you like your steak, Ted? A bit more cooked than medium rare, please. I laughed. Yeah, I have a friend who says a well-cooked steak should still look like it could walk away. So this is the drone you mentioned? Yes, it has six motors and propellers. Is this how you bought it? No, I collected the parts and built it myself. Ted smirked and shook his head slowly. Well, let's watch the video. I turned the laptop so we could both see it. The video started with the drone on the grass, facing the lake. It rose into the air, turned left to show the lake, then spun 360 degrees before pausing. Wait, who is this woman and little girl? I thought you weren't seeing anyone, Ted asked. I'm not. I didn't know them. They were having a picnic near the lake when I arrived. The girl Katie was interested in the drone and wanted to see it fly. The video then rose and moved across the lake toward a marina. It turned left, headed east for a bit, then turned right again, moving south. The drone went over hills and trees, entered a bay, and showed two boats. The scene on the boats was clear as the drone circled and descended, keeping the camera on the people below. Do you recognize anyone besides Sarah? Ted asked. Yes, that's Jessica, Sarah's divorced friend, and the man next to the blonde in the hat is Sarah's boss, Paul Sutton. The other guys are unfamiliar, but I saw at least two of them at the country club. They were talking about buying real estate at the bar last week. James, the one with a can in his hand, was telling Frank, who is behind Sarah, about a good real estate agent who could help him find the best home. Everything started to make sense. Knowing the truth wasn't comforting, but it was something. After dinner, I explained how the hexacopter worked to Ted. We talked about its uses for surveillance and other things. After Ted left, I thought about what we had discussed. I remembered some more points I needed to talk to him about in the coming days, then I got ready for bed. That night, I slept alone. I didn't expect Sarah to come home, and I realized I didn't mind. This bothered me. Why wasn't I more upset by Sarah's betrayal earlier, when I saw clear evidence of her actions? Felt sick at first, but now I just felt numb. How could I lose love for someone I've been with, for more than 20 years, so quickly and easily? Why didn't I see the obvious signs earlier? They've been clear, especially over the past month. In investigative training, instructors teach you not to use certain techniques on your loved ones. These techniques don't work well on people close to you because they feel at ease around you. The tension needed to reveal hidden guilt isn't there. Often, these techniques give false results when used on someone who trusts the examiner. No one wants to believe their partner would lie and cheat. But when faced with undeniable proof, a person has two choices. Some say there are more options, but I don't think so. First, he can accept the betrayal and stay. He can try to make peace with his partner and hope she won't cheat again or agree to her behavior. Second, he can admit what happened and leave her to face the results of her actions. I was tempted to respond with anger and leave a mess behind, but I preferred a more strategic approach. I wasn't prepared to stay and wait for her to ask for forgiveness, counting down the days until the next betrayal. No, if she chose to cheat now, she'll do it again. And I won't live like that. This chapter is over. It's time to move on. I woke up much earlier than usual on Sunday morning. Maybe I didn't sleep at all. 
Either way, I was up before dawn, packing everything I wanted to take with me. As the sun began to shine through the windows on the east side of the house, I stopped to make a quick breakfast of bacon, eggs, and toast. While eating, I called my old friend Jim Wheeler, a detective who works with me, and told him what happened. He was just as shocked as I expected. During our conversation, I told him where Sarah worked and that I caught her cheating. I believe she'd been cheating for at least six weeks, maybe as long as four months. I also told him I had started packing my things and planned to move out as soon as I found a place, even if it was just a motel. Are you saying Sarah works at Sun Real Estate on Broad Street? Jim asked. Yeah, she's been there for about six months. You need to talk to Detective Conrad from the city. Stephanie Conrad? Yes, I know her. We don't talk much, but we've exchanged greetings. Why should I talk to her? You need to meet her. She needs to see the video you made. I'll send you her contact info. Call her right after we hang up. Okay, I'll call to see if she's working today or on call. No, she's at home now. You'll get her card soon. I just sent it to your phone. My phone beeped with a text notification. I saved the info as a new contact. I saved your contact. I'll call her as soon as we're done. So what's the deal with Conrad? How do you have her contact on speed dial and how do you know she's off today? Why do I need to show her my video? We went on dates a couple of times before I started seeing Rachel, and Conrad has been investigating Sutton Real Estate for a few months now. There's a rumor they're running a brothel to boost sales. If your info is right, it could be more than just a rumor. Okay, I need to make more calls. I need to find somewhere to stay until I find a permanent place. And yes, I'll call Conrad. Do you know David Hunter? Jim asked. Yeah, day shift sergeant. Yep. He mentioned he has a house on the lake or a camper near you. He might rent it out. Give him a call. It might be perfect for you until you find something permanent. Thanks. I appreciate your help. Let's meet up soon and go fishing or have a barbecue. Sounds great. You bring the beer. I ended the call and decided to call David Hunter first. Hello? Hey, Dave. How are you? Not bad, Gilmore. Just keeping an eye on things with current public opinion towards police. How are you? Well, to be honest, not great. I just found out Sarah has been cheating on me for a while now and I'm moving out. They told me you have a place by the river that you want to rent out. Yeah, it's just off Hardin Bridge Road. Do you know it? Yes, I do. I'm not sure how long I'll need it. Just until I find something more permanent. But I'd like to pick up my things before lunch today if possible. Hopefully before Sarah gets home. That's fine. How soon can you be ready to meet me there? I checked my watch. It was 7.43 a.m. I've already gathered most of my clothes and personal items. I don't need much. Most of my important things are in the workshop. I'll have to grab my tools and equipment later once I find a place to store them. At the Harden Bridge site, there's an old barn with a dirt floor. The walls are falling apart, but the roof is solid and it's dry inside. There's no electricity, but you can store your tools and anything else that won't fit in the camper until you find another place. Sounds great. I can be there in an hour to meet you and get the keys if that's okay. I ended the call after he gave me the address and directions to an unmarked gate on the property. When I arrived, Dave was standing at a cattle gate leading through a fence overgrown with blackberries, honeysuckle, and cedar trees into a small clearing next to what seemed to be an old house which had burned down or was destroyed long ago. He led me across the clearing along an almost invisible path and about 50 yards into the trees on the opposite side. Hidden in a grove was a modern and well-kept 25-feet camper with two slide-outs and a retractable awning. The camper was right on the riverbank about 20 feet above the water. I got out of the truck and shook Dave's hand. I said, wow, I might decide to stay here. It's beautiful. He replied, well, I might be tempted to sell the whole place if someone makes a good offer. I've thought about it for years, but I just couldn't let someone I don't know and trust take over. If you're serious, maybe we can talk once I'm done with this case in the next few weeks. No problem. Here are your keys. 
rent covers the electricity, but you will have to refill the propane tanks for the heater and stove. The water is from a well 250 feet deep and is clear and sweet. Let me show you the gray water tank. There's no septic tank here. When it's almost full, you can disconnect the hose and it's ready to go. You can pour it out next to the boat dock. Removal is free. It belongs to the county. Thanks. I need to unload my stuff and try to grab as much of my tools and equipment as possible before Sarah gets home. When I meet her, I prefer not to return to the house more often than needed. Honestly, I don't trust myself. I'm too calm about it and it worries me. I'm pretty good at keeping things separate and controlling my anger, but I'd rather not take risks. As it turned out, I didn't need to worry. I made two more trips and picked up enough to be sure that if I didn't get anything else from the house, I wouldn't regret it. I stored my tools and my project boat in a surprisingly large shed on the Harden Bridge property and returned to my new spot on the riverbank. By 4 p.m., I still hadn't heard anything from Sarah. Sitting in a folding chair by a circle of stones around a small fire, sipping a beer and watching the water flow below, I remembered I promised to call Stephanie Conrad. So I picked up the phone and dialed her number. Hello? Hi, Detective Conrad, how are you this evening? Gilmore Wheeler said you'd call, but I expected a call a couple of hours ago. Yes, sorry about that. I was moving today and didn't get a chance earlier. He didn't tell me much. He said you have a video I need to see urgently, said it was related to one of my active investigations. That's what he told me to. I can meet you tomorrow, either at your office or we can meet for lunch somewhere if you prefer. I'd rather see the video today if possible. I has dated. To be honest, it's been a long day. A long weekend, actually. I'm tired and I've already had a couple of beers. I'm afraid I'm busy for the evening. It's okay, I can come to you. Just tell me where you are now. I'm on Harden Bridge Road, just off Highway 411. Do you think you can find it that far outside town? I asked, smiling to myself. Yes, smart guy, we have Google Maps so we can find places these days. We both laughed briefly before she spoke again. Already had dinner? Not yet, I replied. I wasn't in the mood today and I need to go to the store before I can plan anything resembling a meal. Okay, I'll be there in an hour. Call me when you turn onto Hardin Bridge Road and I'll meet you at the gate on the right side, about two and a half miles from the highway. An hour and twenty minutes later, I closed the gate behind a white Ford Expedition, which looked about six or seven years old, and led it to my trailer on the river. A petite woman got out of the driver's door, looking lovely in jeans and a loose pullover. Her shoulder-length hair and bright green eyes caught my attention as she reached back into the truck and pulled out a yellow box and a pack of Guinness Stout. I hope you like Cajun fried chicken and real beer. I didn't think you'd drink light beer. Now that I'm here, I hope my guess was right. I smiled. I don't drink beer often, but when I do, the lightest I can handle is you, Ingling. I had an Amberbach this evening, but I love a good stout. We went to the camper to eat without being bothered by mosquitoes and flies. After the meal, Stephanie asked me what I knew about her investigation of Sutton real estate. Practically nothing, I replied. I just found out this morning that someone is doing business for the agency. My wife works there, and I found out this weekend that she has been cheating on me for a while now. Stephanie's face went pale. Oh no, not Sarah Gilmore, she said. I didn't make the connection. She looked down at the table, thinking. Yeah, she's been unfaithful for almost a month now, Stephanie continued. It seems they've been getting her involved in their system for months. I think she fully joined three weeks ago at a party with some agency clients. I looked out the window, feeling like my marriage was falling apart, and said, she told me she spent the last six Saturdays with Jessica Walker at her father's house in Kingston. Stephanie got up, went to the fridge, and brought back two cans of beer. She handed me one, and we both poured our drinks into glasses. That may be true for the first three weekends, but I think she spent the last two differently. Having fun with the other women from the estate agency, I said. And you're saying she did it again this weekend? Yes, Stephanie nodded. On several boats in a bay on Lake Altoona. That makes sense, I sighed. I didn't get any reports of them doing anything in town this weekend. She seemed lost in thought, twirling a can of beer between her hands before speaking again. My case is coming together and I can't leave your wife out when I file charges. 
she already faces at least half a dozen charges. What charges, I asked. Stephanie hesitated, then looked me in the eyes. Solicitation. Violating the Georgia Controlled Substances Act. Maybe more as we go through the evidence. She will be brought in with the rest, just as guilty as everyone else. Her eyes were sad, almost sorry for me. Isolate her, I said. I'm not asking you to protect her. She made her choice. Let her face the consequences. Stephanie paused, nodded, and asked me to show her the video. When it ended, I saved a copy on a flash drive from my bag and gave it to her. She said it wasn't strong on its own, but combined with other evidence, it would be powerful. She told me about her investigation, starting with a complaint from a rival real estate agent. A potential client had asked if she would be willing to sweeten the deal for a sale, as Sutton's agency does. When the agent asked what he meant, he explained that successful sales agents at Sutton's were women because they performed sexual acts to close deals. The agent kicked the client out and then called the police. Stephanie was assigned to the case. The investigation revealed that Sutton was distributing illegal substances and running a small trafficking ring under the cover of a real estate agency. They also planned to include three other agencies in their warrant applications. Stephanie and her captain were working with the district attorney, figuring out how to handle the case without causing chaos in the community. Many families might start having doubts, which could lead to more domestic problem reports. She said both investigators and prosecutors were ready to start the warrant process in a week or two. With the video, they were prepared to begin. It was getting late and we had finished most of the beer. Stephanie asked if she could stay the night, as she couldn't drive. Look, I don't want to sound rude or make you uncomfortable, but all I can offer is an uncomfortable folding bed, I said. Despite what Sarah did, I've never broken my vows. Until the paperwork is done and the court order is issued, I'm still married. Sorry if I'm overthinking, but we are both a bit drunk, and it's easy to make bad decisions right now. It's okay, Stephanie replied. My only other option would be to sleep in my truck until I sober up. But let's talk about it again when things settle down a bit. Sounds good. Do you have a bag with you? I asked. No, I have a bag at home, but nothing in my truck. There should be a big shirt you can wear if you want. Have you seen the shower head on the hose hanging on the bathroom wall? The whole bathroom is a shower. You can go first. I don't know how long the hot water will last. I'll lower the table and prepare your bed while you finish up in the bathroom. When Stephanie came out of the bathroom, she was still wearing my old pink Floyd Wish You Were Here t-shirt, which almost reached her knees. It was then that I noticed how well her sweater had hidden her figure. I began to rethink my decision about us sleeping in separate beds. But then I realized that my thoughts only confirmed we needed to keep some distance. What time do you need to be at work in the morning? I asked her. She said she needed to be there by nine, which meant breakfast would be around seven. This would give her enough time to go home and change for work. I then went to my own bedroom and lay down, feeling both sleepy and thoughtful. On Monday morning, I woke up with a dry mouth and a slight headache, but I wasn't exactly hungover. I went to the small bedroom at the end of the camper, determined to start my day. When I got to the stove, I saw Stephanie still in my Pink Floyd t-shirt and nothing else. She turned to face me and smiled. Good morning, she said, but it's not fair or nice to make me sleep on an uncomfortable pile of pillows. If you're going to tease me like that in the morning, she continued, still smiling. I looked down and realized I was naked. I had been so focused on getting to the bathroom that I forgot to put on clothes. Embarrassed, I walked back to my room and put on some running shorts and a t-shirt. As I returned, I apologized to Stephanie for my accidental exposure. Don't apologize, she said with a grin. I promise I don't mind. We had a quick breakfast and got dressed. Stephanie wore the jeans she had on the day before under my t-shirt. As she buttoned her jeans, she kept her eyes on me and smiled playfully. After finishing our morning routine, I closed the gate as we both left. Stephanie presumably went home to change into clean clothes for work. I arrived at the office earlier than the other detectives and started looking into my open cases. I had 36 active tasks and highlighted five to focus on for the day. I checked my phone and saw that I had over a dozen text messages, 16 missed calls, and nine voicemails. I realized I hadn't heard from Sarah because my phone's ringtone was turned off. 
Listening to the voicemails, I noticed they went from angry to sad. By the last message, Sarah was crying and asking me to come home. Her texts followed the same pattern. I sent her a message saying I was busy and would talk to her later if I had a chance. At almost 10 am, I called the law firm of Parker, Kilgore and Hughes and asked for Ted's office. Ted Kilgore's office. How may I help you? The secretary said. I need to talk to Ted, please. This is Sean Gilmore. He's expecting my call, I replied. Just a moment, she said. Sean, how are you this morning? Have you done anything silly since we last talked? Ted asked. No, Ted. I moved and am now renting a camper near you. I haven't seen Sarah since Friday, not in person anyway, I said. Did you talk to her? Ted inquired. She blew up my phone yesterday and this morning. I said I'd talk to her later tonight if I had a chance, I told him. Don't try to get back at her. Let me handle it through the court. Were you able to submit the documents this morning? Ted asked. No, it will be tomorrow, likely after lunch, I said. Okay, we need to meet again. There have been some changes since Saturday. Are you representing anyone involved with Sarah? I asked. No, I haven't been approached by anyone related to Sutton Real Estate, Ted confirmed. All right, thanks. Let me know when you submit the documents, I said. Sounds like a plan, Ted replied. We hung up and I left the office to interview some witnesses for my cases. I managed to keep thoughts of Sarah and Sutton Real Estate out of my mind for a while. Since I had been in the office early, I left at 4.30 p.m. on my way to the river. I stopped at the grocery store to buy enough food to last through the weekend. I limited the refrigerated items to see how much I could store. Back at the camper, I put away the groceries and changed into baggy shorts and a tank top, ready to unwind. I ignored all of Sarah's calls and texts today, but I decided it was finally time to call her. I didn't want to talk about our fight over the phone or through messages. We needed to speak in person, face to face. I wouldn't hide from her or our problems. Just as I was about to dial her number, Stephanie called me. Hello, detective, she said. Hey, Gilmore, are you close to the office? No, I'm at home. I'm planning to relax this evening. What's up? Are you back home? Yes, Stephanie said. Then, realizing she meant the house Sarah and I shared, I added, no, I'm at the river house now. This is my home. Oh, well, I have a huge favor to ask and I'd rather not discuss it over the phone. Can I come over tonight? I can bring dinner. Sure. Do you like fried pork chops? I love them. Great. I'll get an extra chop ready. The gate will be open. Please close it behind you. I will. Have you spoken to Sarah? I was about to call her when you rang. Okay. Part of the favor is not to mention the video or my investigation for a few days. I won't mention it until we've talked. See you in about an hour. After hanging up, I dialed Sarah's number. She answered before the first ring ended. Sean, where are you? You must come home. I don't need to be there right now. You made your choice, and I made mine. I tried to tell you how serious things had become, but you didn't listen. You made your job your priority and disrespected me, I disagree, so I left. Until we can sort out the situation. 